Hello creepy friends, welcome or welcome back to my channel. Today we're going to be doing my May reading wrap up. As always, on the screen you'll see me finishing up my May reading journal spreads, and on the voiceover you'll hear a short review of all the books I read in May. There will be links to all the books that I mention and to all the materials that I'm using down in the description box below. We have 14 books to talk about this month, so we don't have time for stats. So grab your coffee or your tea or any other drink, get cozy and comfy, and we're going to start right in on the reviews. Murder at Pirate's Cove by Josh Lanyon This book is advertised as a cozy mystery, and it's the first book in the Secrets and Scrabble series. The main character, Ellery, inherits an old dilapidated mansion and a mystery genre bookstore from a distant aunt and moves to that small town to start a new chapter in his life. Unfortunately for Ellery, one of the townsfolk is found dead in his bookstore, which kicks off the murder mystery. Ellery is pining after the town sheriff, who's a widower, and it's intimated that a relationship starts up between them in the subsequent books. Unfortunately, this was not a great book. The mystery was very predictable, and Ellery does so many nonsensical things seemingly just to create plot. And you can see the ending coming from a mile away. It was fine as something that you might just put on while cleaning the house or something, so that you have something on in the background. It doesn't have anything terribly offensive in it or anything, but it's not great writing. This book wasn't for me, and I wouldn't really recommend it. The Hunter by Tana French. This is the newest crime novel by Tana French, and it's the second book in her Cal Hooper series. It's set in the farmlands of Ireland and follows Cal Hooper, a retired American detective who now lives in the rural village of Ardnakelty. The disreputable Johnny Kelly returns back to town with claims of gold in the hills and a get-rich scheme for the villagers. The story unfolds from there, with lies, scams, and scandals, and a little bit of murder as well, and Cal trying to uncover what's going on. Tana French's novels tend to be hit or miss for me. Some of them I've given five stars, and some of them are just okay. I would file this one somewhere in the middle. As always, French's writing is lyrically descriptive of the Irish countryside and the characters of the town, and really makes you feel as if you can really see it. If you want stories that make you feel like you're really in Ireland, French's books will do it for you. However, I wasn't interested in the plot and characters in this one as much as in some of her other books, like The Likeness or The Secret Place. If you're someone who enjoys slow-paced mysteries with a lot of character work in them and with tons of vibes, this book might be for you. Hear the Wind Sing, Pinball 1973, and The Strange Library by Haruki Murakami. I read these three short books by Murakami this month. The first two, Hear the Wind Sing and Pinball 1973, are his first published works and their novellas. And The Strange Library is a short story. The only way to get Hear the Wind Sing and Pinball 1973, in English at least, is in a bind-up called Wind Slash Pinball. So just be aware of that if you're looking for them. They are books one and two in the Rat series that follows an unnamed narrator and this guy he knows called the Rat. These are not Murakami's best work since they're from the very beginning of his career, but they still have that distinctive Murakami narrative voice, but without the magical realism or surrealism of a lot of his later work. They also feature much talk of breasts and some weird sexual situations, as all of Murakami's books do. If you're a Murakami fan, then it is interesting to kind of see how he started. I gave these a middling rating of three stars. The writing is good, but the plots are pretty forgettable, so I wouldn't really recommend these to the general public. If you want to get started with Murakami, there are plenty of better places to start, such as The Wind-Up Bird Chronicle or Kafka on the Shore. The Strange Library is a short story in a book by itself, and it's illustrated. It reads sort of like a scary fairy tale, with a young boy being held prisoner in the basement of his local library. There are a few characters that show up who are familiar from other Murakami books. This book is full of weird characters and magical realism, but again, it was a little forgettable for me. 
but the art included in this book is really unsettling and beautiful, so that's what really makes it. No One Is Talking About This by Patricia Lockwood This award-winning debut novel just didn't hit for me the way that I wanted it to. We follow an unnamed main character through two sections of the book. The first part is written in a stream of consciousness style with the protagonist exploring her relationship to her own internet persona and her career as an internet personality and influencer after she unexpectedly went viral. This section was interesting and reads sort of like a social media feed, with Lockwood exploring how we live in this interconnected way with our constructed identities. The second part of the book takes place mostly at a hospital as the protagonist's niece is born with an extremely rare disease and is not expected to live long. She abandons her internet life and spends her time with her sister and the baby trying to get as much time with her niece as she can before the end. This part of the book is, as you would expect, very emotional and upsetting. It's semi-autobiographical as Lockwood went through a similar experience in her own life. I'm sure to a lot of people this section would really hit home for them, but I just didn't feel that way. As a disabled person, some of the writing in this section felt ableist to me. I felt a little bit icky the way that her niece was described in some places, so that's why I couldn't get fully on board with it. However, as I mentioned, this book has won several awards and was nominated for a Booker Prize, so you may find something in it that I didn't especially in the inventive and fresh writing style. The Woman in the Dunes by Kobo Abe. This review was cut for time, but you can read the full review at bibliocreep.com. Read this if you're looking for a surrealist classic of Japanese literature translated from Japanese and written in the 1960s. Existential dread, feelings of claustrophobia, themes that still hold up today and can be applied as a critique of capitalism, a story that takes place in one location and with mainly two characters. This is a classic of Japanese literature written by one of Japan's most well-known authors. The story follows a man who goes out to do some amateur entomology looking for insects to catalog in the sand dunes along the coast. When he spends a little too much time there and misses the last bus of the day, he encounters a small village and asks if he can stay the night. In the dark, a villager leads him to a rope ladder and tells him to climb down to stay with one of the women of the village for the night. The man realizes in the morning that he is now trapped in the dunes at the bottom of a sand pit and at the mercy of the villagers above. The story then follows the man's anger, despair, and attempts at rebellion while he psychologically devolves to a calamitous ending. The most obvious parallel to modern American culture I can see in this book is the existential dread of toiling away at a meaningless task day after day just to earn the basic essentials of life. The sand blows back in every day and the villagers must engage in backbreaking work to shovel it out to prevent their homes from being completely covered, day in and day out, with no respite. If they don't complete their work, the leaders of the town withhold their water ration. The main character desperately tries to escape and goes through many stages of anger and grief about his situation until he eventually resigns himself to it. The writing in this novel has a dreamlike quality that is evocative and claustrophobic, with Abe making you feel the desperation and thirst of the two main characters. I really enjoyed the writing style and the smart critique of social issues in this book. Readers who enjoy work by Albert Camus or Franz Kafka or more modern dystopian fiction would probably find this book engrossing. However, avoid picking this up if you are not in the mood for darker themes. Interior Chinatown by Charles Yu This book has a very interesting structure. It's written as if it's a screenplay, so you get all the stage directions that tell where the scene is set and what activity is going on. Our main character, Willis Wu, is an actor generally getting bit parts such as generic Asian man, he aspires to the biggest role that he believes Asian American men can hope for in Hollywood, Kung Fu Guy. The story goes into the lack of Asian representation in media and the internalized racism that can sometimes limit people's visions for themselves. As he starts to get bigger roles, he begins to get wrapped up in the expectations of the industry and starts to see his wife and daughter less and less, 
causing a rift until Willis is able to grow and see how he can make a happier life for his family. The writing in this novel was great, and it was also really nice to see a book delving into some of the problems that are faced by Asian American men, as I haven't really ever seen that in a book before. There's also a lot of humor in the book, and the main character feels like a real person who might live on your block. The only complaint I have is that the ending scenes are a bit long and were a bit repetitive as the main message of the novel was really being hammered home. Overall, I think anyone who enjoys contemporary fiction that addresses social issues with a large dash of humor would enjoy this book. Yellow Face by R.F. Kwong. This review was edited for time, but the full review can be read on bibliocreep.com. Read this if you're looking for a jealousy-induced downward spiral of lies and scandal, commentary on the structural racism in the publishing industry and America in general, plagiarism and appropriation with a white writer stealing the work of an Asian American writer, and an expert depiction of how we can justify our own actions to ourselves and refuse to take accountability even when we're caught. This was the first book I've read from Rebecca F. Kwong, and I thought it was very expertly written. We follow Juniper, a white woman who has, so far, seen mediocre success as a writer. She has a beautiful and enigmatic Asian American friend, Athena, who has been making it big in the industry and is a celebrated young author. When Athena dies accidentally one night, Juniper takes the opportunity to steal Athena's latest work in progress. Juniper publishes the book in her own name and gains critical acclaim, and she starts a downward spiral of lies upon lies. The story investigates the darker side of the publishing industry and the rampant institutionalized racism that still exists there. It also interrogates our online culture and how scandals can blow up very quickly. The writing style was very readable, written in the first person. There's a lot of suspense and the stakes are high, so it keeps you very engaged the whole way through. Kwong did a masterful job of showing how Juniper is able to justify her actions to herself, convincing herself that what she's doing is okay and that she deserves the accolades and the success. This book was fairly stressful for me to read, perhaps because it seems so real to life. Don't take me wrong though, this book did exactly what it set out to do and it did it very effectively. I would recommend this book to anyone who is interested in the workings of the publishing industry, structural racism in America, or those who enjoy a taut thriller. Amatka by Karen Tidebeck. This novel was translated from Swedish. This sci-fi horror story was very unique and also unsettling. It's set on a planet somewhere. It seems like it's not Earth, but it's not entirely clear. Our main character, Vanja, has traveled from her home settlement to the city of Amatka to work on an assignment. The story focuses on the importance of language in shaping the world. The authoritarian government has put many rules in place in order to maintain the literal structure of matter. If the residents do not label their objects by saying the names of the objects to them every day, then the objects will begin to lose form and disintegrate into a gooey mass. The public seems to respond to this prospect with great fear. Strangely, the objects that made the journey with the original settlers do not have this problem. Vanja starts to question some of the rules and regulations, and meets some other people who are also dissidents. Then she starts to find out what's really going on underneath the rules and regulations, and the disturbing truth is revealed. This book was so interesting, especially this concept of language holding reality together. It also delves into themes of authoritarianism and political oppression. It does a great job of slowly building a sense of unease throughout the novel, until you get to the spectacular ending, which includes some cosmic horror. It also felt like a puzzle. I had a good time trying to put the pieces together while I was reading. Additionally, there is a sapphic love story as a minor part to the plot, with Vanja falling in love with her roommate. This book is a really unique find that I don't see promoted much, so I would encourage you to pick it up if you enjoy weird speculative fiction, mysterious conspiracies, and other weird fiction like The City and the City by China Mieville or the Southern Reach series by Jeff Vandermeer. The Eyes Are the Best Part by Monica Kim. This was an ARC review. 
and the publishing date was June 25th, 2024. Read this if you're looking for a young Korean-American woman who starts feeling disturbing urges around blue eyes, major body horror and stomach-churning imagery, a lot of eyeball stuff, condescending men getting their comeuppance, themes of misogyny, racism, fetishization, and feeling like you don't fit in, and a good-for-her ending. This book was right up my alley, and it was a quick short read. Our main character, Ji Won, is a young Korean-American woman in her first year of college, when her father leaves the family for another woman, leaving Ji Won, her mother, and her sister behind. Ji Won's mother seems inconsolable until she meets a new man, a white man named George, who fetishizes Asian women and expects them to be meek and submissive. George proceeds to be gross, while Ji Won starts to have disturbing fantasies about his mesmerizing blue eyes. Jiwon starts to unravel and begins on a journey of violence, concluding in a satisfying ending. This book was very well written, and the characters were very realistic and relatable. Jiwon's mother is painted perfectly as a woman who doesn't know who she is without a man in her life, and Jiwon is angry and frustrated. I loved how the author mirrored the fetishization of Asian women by the male characters with Jiwon's fetishization of blue eyes. This was super gory, so if eyeball stuff grosses you out, this is not the book for you. Kim also includes a lot of dark humor, especially around the character of Jeffrey, who is another white man who becomes obsessed with Jiwon while continuously attempting to convince everyone he's a nice guy, and that he's not like those other men. This book is outstanding for a debut, and I would enthusiastically recommend it for lovers of body horror and revenge tales. Death Valley by Melissa Broder. Read this if you're looking for a surreal trip through the desert, a funny and relatable main character, a meditation on grief and depression, dark humor, conversations with a mystical cactus, bisexual representation, and heatstroke vibes. This book was so weird in the best possible way. It is a strange surrealist journey through the desert that makes you feel as if you are hallucinating from dehydration. It's the first book I've read from Melissa Broder, and I will definitely be picking up her other work. We follow an unnamed female protagonist who is a writer staying in a Best Western in the California desert near Death Valley. She has traveled there from LA, supposedly to work, but in reality it seems she is fleeing from the depression and pain of her father being in the hospital near death and her husband living with a long-term chronic disease. When the front desk clerk at the Best Western tells her of a nice desert hike nearby, our protagonist decides to check it out. When she does, she encounters a saguaro cactus, which is not supposed to be living in that part of the country. The mystical succulent has a gash in the side, which seems to be calling to the main character. She pushes her body inside the cactus and enters a hallucinatory fever dream, with visions of her father and other memories from her life. On a second foray back to the cactus, she becomes lost in the desert, and the story becomes one of survival, with her suffering from heat stroke and dehydration, seeing many more visions, talking to rocks, and almost dying in the process. Broder's writing is witty and darkly funny. I even found myself laughing out loud a few times. At the same time, Broder is able to eloquently and incisively portray the feelings of disconnection and ennui that come with depression and loss, as well as the inward-looking and sometimes self-absorbed behavior that can also come with mental illness. The story delves into grief with the protagonist quite literally journeying through Death Valley. As I usually do, I found this mentally ill and slightly unhinged main character extremely relatable. We are in the head of the main character the entire book, so we get a good insight into her life and feelings, and she feels like a fleshed out character. I highly recommend this novel for people who enjoy surrealism, dark humor, hallucinatory journeys, and slightly unhinged female protagonists. The Bell Jar by Sylvia Plath this review was edited for time, but you can read the full review at bibliocreep.com. Read this if you're looking for the quintessential sad white girl novel, an unreliable narrator, deep exploration of depression, mental illness, and women's roles in society, 
gorgeous descriptions of what it feels like to be depressed and disconnected, and depictions of various mental health treatments of the 1960s, including electroshock therapy. Surprising to no one, I love this book. Any well-written sad girl novel will get me. In this semi-autobiographical novel, we follow 19-year-old Esther Greenwood, who is invited to New York City for a summer internship. In the city, Esther is unmotivated and is failing to show up at work. She goes through several experiences that emphasize her disconnection from others and her feelings of being trapped by society's expectations of her. After the internship concludes, she was hoping to attend a prestigious writing course, but finds that she wasn't accepted. She returns to her mother's house for the rest of the summer, where her mental health deteriorates more and more, with her entering a kind of hallucinatory state until she is finally institutionalized for treatment. Sylvia Plath was primarily a poet, and it shows. The writing in this novel is simply gorgeous. It really portrays the feelings of severe depression and anxiety in a way that is so full of truth. You really feel Esther's experience of floating through life, disassociated and melancholy. The novel also focuses heavily on themes of women's oppression. Esther frequently states that she does not want to get married or have kids. However, she is engaged to be married to a man whom she doesn't love and who expects her to be a homemaker. I've never read anything that more accurately describes my personal experience of mental illness, especially at my worst period in my 20s. While Esther may not be the nicest person, I found the way that she is portrayed to be very, very accurate and very, very relatable. Most likely due to the time it was written, the book does contain some racist and homophobic comments and also talks a lot about suicide, so check the content warnings before reading. I recommend this to anyone who loves sad girl literary fiction or works by such writers as Virginia Woolf, Otessa Moshfeg, or Melissa Broder. A quote from The Bell Jar. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of the fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black, and one by one they plopped to the ground at my feet. Untold Night and Day by Bay Sua. This was my favorite book that I read in May. It's a riotous jumble of surrealist imagery and parallel and repeating themes and phrases. And it's an homage to The Blind Owl by Sadeke Hedayat, which was one of my best books of 2023. The Blind Owl is ref referenced heavily, and the structure of the prose is similar, but I don't think you have to have read it in order to enjoy this book. Like with most surrealist literature, I thoroughly enjoyed the ride, but I probably need a few more rereads in order to make more sense of it. Our main character, Ayami, is a former actor and is finishing up her last day of work at an audio theater in Seoul. The theater is closing for good and Ayami closes up the theater and then sets out into the city, where many strange incidents happen throughout the night, with all the residents suffering from a major heat wave. The prose is written so beautifully, giving you a sense of the oppressive heat and darkness in the city that night. The plot is difficult to describe with the narrative jumping around in time and with the same descriptions being used for multiple characters or scenes, causing a sense of circularity and repetition in the work, almost like musical phrases. There is also an uncertainness about what is real and what isn't, or if the definition of real means anything at all. The different sections of the book weave together connected by these repetitions and the number of connections increase until you reach the end. The novel also plays with themes of light and darkness, like the juxtaposition of night and day. The audio theater often has blind patrons who attend the performances. Ayami and her former supervisor go to dinner at a restaurant where people eat in complete darkness to better experience the taste of their food. I wouldn't recommend this book for a wide audience, as it doesn't have a traditional plot, and the structure is unusual, which will not be up everyone's alley. But if you enjoy surrealism, musical writing, and hallucinatory vibes of floating through a searing hot city in the middle of the night, this book may be for you. And that concludes my May reading wrap-up. Thank you so much for joining me, and I appreciate all of you. 
I hope you found it to be fun and relaxing, and that maybe you found a few books that sounded interesting. I also hope that you'll join me next week. I'll be releasing my July reading journal setup, and it's going to have a camping theme. As I mentioned before, longer versions of some of these reviews can be found at my new website, bibliocreep.com, where I'm posting more book review content. You can also join me on my other social media channels for more journaling and book content, and my handle at Instagram and everywhere else is at biblio underscore creep. I hope you're all having a great start to your summer, and remember, be kind to yourself and to everyone else, drink your water, and take some time to do the things that you enjoy. I'll see you in the next one. Bye.